and welcome to Banking Transform, the top podcast in retail banking. I'm your host, Jim Maroos, founder and CEO of the Digital Banking Report and co-publisher of the Financial Brand. Open banking has become a major driver of digital transformation across the entire financial sector, revolutionizing payments, lending, investments, and transactional ecosystems almost overnight. But the full potential of APIs and open banking have yet to be realized. The question is, will 2023 be the watershed year for open finance in the U.S. and globally, or will regulation and the slow economy slow innovation process down to a crawl? We have Ritesh John, fintech founder, PhD, and advisor and previous CTO of HSBC and the Banking Transform podcast. Ritesh shares his perspective on the growth of APIs and open banking and what he expects to see in 2023 and beyond. Tough economic times will most likely impact investment made by financial institutions in innovation and digital banking transformation. That said, open banking still has a role throughout the entire financial services ecosystem, especially as we enter 2023. So Ritesh, where do you see the biggest opportunities around open banking innovation in 2023? And how will this innovation be impacted by the current economic uncertainty? First and foremost, thank you, Jim, for inviting me over here and pleasure to be here. What I see open banking opportunities in 2023, specifically from the perspective of potential downturn, is a lot more opportunity for the fintechs as well as the large financial institutions. Because there are umpteen use cases around the payments. As you know, in the financial world, everything evolves and revolves around the payments. So right. we love that. So there was a quite a lot of opportunity for fintechs and the financial institutions to offer lending to the customers, offer lending at a very lucrative rates, and provide benefits to the customer for their own financial well-being. Because that's what customer would be looking at for the fintechs as well as financial institutions, because they would be going through a potential downturn and the cash is going to be a difficult uh, for the customers. Similarly, uh, there are a lot of use cases uh, that we can talk about, especially from the consumer credit card perspective, or similarly in the commercial or the corporate credit card perspective as well. So there are umpteen use cases and the potential that I see and the use and the growth of the open banking in 2023 with respect to the potential downturn. You know, it's interesting. I've said often that consumers are already embracing open bank without even you know knowing it. Because you know, for my institution, my situation, I have my traditional financial institution relationships, but then I have other relationships with other types of financial institutions, including my card relationships, my loan relationships, sometimes my investment relationships, and and I kind of have this whole open banking ecosystem, but it's not driven by one financial institution. At the same time, all this is happening. You know, governments are playing a more and more important role, especially in the U.S. and some other countries where they're doubling down on their efforts to control fintech expansion, try to make the regulations similar between traditional and non-traditional financial institutions. You know, how do you see regulation possibly impacting negatively or positively the whole open banking uh, potential? Very interesting, uh, Jim. We need our regulations around the various financial innovation, right? Regardless, because what we have seen in the uh, crypto market quite recently and over and over again, and let's not even talk about the large financial institutions as well, what we have seen with the likes of Wells Fargo and others as well in the recent times. So the open banking is a new phenomena, right? It's a bank is opening up their channels, or I call it as a banks are washing up their dirty laundry in an open space. Right. So the third party providers are consuming the banking services and offering the better services to the consumers. The thing which is really going to be interesting is from the customer security and the customer data and the regulation around the customer authentication. So for an example, uh, FCA, as you know, that we started from the UK in the open banking space. And right. uh, FCA has recently come up with a regulation where uh, they are getting rid of the 90 day re-authentication process in the customer journey, which is a very good and positive sign because that was a point where 20 to 40% customer would uh, give away 
from open banking network, right? But providing that option to the customer and putting that on us onto the open banking platform is a positive sign uh, that we will see a lot more growth in the open banking space, as well as the customer utilization of the open banking channel in the third party providers. And we will see quite a lot of stickiness around it. You know, it's interesting. We've seen some major advances in the last few years around use of APIs and open banking. But how have these advances really helped the consumer? What have you seen in the marketplace? Because you have a more global perspective than, than I do in many cases. And I knew, know many of the advances have been done in the UK, in India, in the Far East, and things of this nature. But what type of major innovations have you seen around the open banking ecosystem that have helped the consumer? See, there are umpteen use cases that we have seen across. Uh, it's from the the basic thing that bank has started offering was the PFM, that is the personal, uh, personal financial management in yep. terms of the account aggregation. But what we see for the benefit for the consumers is getting rid of the charges, right? So account to account transfer, that is one thing. And uh, using the real time payments, uh, that's beneficiary for the customer because of redu charge reductions, right? Obviously it is going to put some pressure onto the merchants as well. So there are, as we know that there's a quite a significant pressure on the merchants over the period of time that the merchant discount rates should be reduced or MDR should go to zero in certain jurisdiction. And that's what we see in India for that matter, right? And uh, so the customer is getting benefit by consolidating the data, by the data aggregation, by the payment initiation service where they can initiate the payments directly from the accounts. So, uh, and that benefits merchants as well, right? So it's a win-win situation for merchants as well as the customer. And on the top of that, with the data aggregation, customer get quite a lot of offers from the service providers for the variety of the things that they use in day in and day out, especially for, for that matter, utilities or the other services that they use day in and day out. So. It's a win-win situation for the customer as well as the uh, service provider. So, you know, open banking has the potential to fuel growth and provide the impetus to build solutions for underserved segments, both in the consumer area and in small businesses. Can you provide some success stories that you've seen around the providing of additional services for underserved markets? I have a very clear view on the underserved market because when people talk about open banking, they talk open banking more along with the financial inclusion, right? Yes, open banking has got potential to fill the gap of the financial inclusion to an extent, right? Let's be realistic for the financial inclusion. The biggest challenge is the identity, right? And the biggest example that we have seen in the global market is like UPI and the Aadhaar card, which is the unique identity solution uh, in India, which has addressed the significant problem of financial inclusion in the country. But let's be realistic. When we talk about the financial inclusion, it's not only about access to the basic financial services. Basically, people need money. So what you need to do is provide access to the money. How you are going to do that? Because the people who are out of the financial services remit, they do not have a record Right? How you are going to establish that record, that credit. So it's about utilizing the alternate data of the consumers. And there are umpteen examples in the African market as well as an Asian market, especially uh, India as well as Southeast Asian market as well, where the financial institutions or the microfinance company is capturing the alternate data and lending to the consumers, those who are not even into the mainstream financial uh, service or financially excluded. So there was a huge opportunity, but let's not get clouded that open banking is going to address the financial inclusion problem completely. And let me give you another perspective, Jim. Uh, the interesting thing that I've seen in the financial inclusion side, the most of the countries uh, that we talk about, right? The financial inclusion is growing at a rapid pace, but the challenge comes down to the financial literacy as well. So the financial literacy is becoming a lot bigger challenge than the financial inclusion. Right. And the second challenge is access to money. So by just providing a bank account is not going to solve the problem for the customers. You need to provide access to the money. 
You know, you know, it's interesting. You talk about access to money, and that brings up buy now, pay later, which is is in a way an open banking solution. As we look at it now, I mean, if I had asked you this question 12 months ago, we would have probably said it's an overwhelming success with some asterisks as to, okay, maybe it's created its own problems. Is is the buy now, pay later um, solution really a good solution the way it's been presented? Or what flaws have have been seen in the whole buy now, pay later solution in the marketplace. Obviously, it's provided access to credit, but there's also been credit provided to people that probably shouldn't have had it. What What do you see? Is, a, is the final outcome a, a success or somewhat of a failure? Thanks, Jim. It's a very interesting one again. So I had a very interesting conversation on buy now, pay later uh, when it's colliding with the open banking, right? So the buy now, pay later whether you talk about the buy now, pay later, again, it evolves and revolves around the money, right? It's the evolution in the financial services. And let's be realistic, it is nothing new, right? It has been existing earlier. And thanks to the digitization by the banks and the fintech and the financial services, they have reduced the friction and as well as the retailers as well, right? They have reduced the friction from the customer journey and the companies have took that as an opportunity to introduce a new product, which is embedded finance and the buy now pay later, right? It is an excellent product, but at the same time, it comes with its own challenges as well. It removes the friction, but as long as you consider buy now pay later as another credit agreement to the consumers, it's great. If you don't, then we are pushing people into a debt cycle. Right. We have already seen that with the debt, the growing debt in the various economies. For an example, like UK has 60 million population, 66 million credit cards in rotation, mm -hmm. with over 60 billion outstanding credit card debt. And this is just the credit card debt I'm talking about. That is obviously minuscule in comparison to the US. At the same time, I'm privy to buy now, pay later, what with the right regulation around it. So if the credit bureaus are getting the data of the buy now, pay later, and it is considered as a credit agreement, it's great. Because ultimately, if you look into the, uh, who is making money out of it? The companies, those who are providing the buy now, pay later services, the merchant is taking the hit. Obviously that is going to be passed on to the consumers and the financial institutions who are backing up these companies as well, they are eyeing the top line growth. Similarly, like the credit card, right? It's a similar right. sort of business if you think from uh, from a different lens. So everybody is eyeing that top line growth and they're hoping that customer would default. Yeah, and it's a structure, the regulation, but also, you know, it, it was easy to justify some of these models when the economy was strong. But, you know, now that payment is difficult to make for some people, then it, it creates its own problems. Um, you know, when we look at, Open banking overall, it can be executed in many ways, including banking as a service, banking as a platform, and even embedded banking solutions. Which model do you believe has the greatest potential of those three? Thanks, Jim. As you said about uh, open banking, and there are different models, and I call it as a revenue generation model as well, like the banking as a channel, right? So. Now, what we are seeing, like a lot of banks that they have got their own uh, developer portals, like BBVA has got API underscore market or the api.hsbc.com for HSBC or the developers.barclays.com for the Barclays, right? Similarly, uh, we have got a banking as a platform as well, uh, likes of Bankable and the Mambo's of the world and Solus Bank, BBVA, Green Dot and multiple others as well. On the other hand, we have got a distributor and the aggregator model as well. So the typical distributor model uh, that we look into it as like N26, they were the early ones after the financial crisis in the market. Or the aggregator model, which is like the played Finicity uh, two layer, uh, which is typically open banking platform. That's what we call it. So the model that I'm seeing uh, and which I'm seeing growth with is the banking as a service platform. Uh, you know, we have discussed 17 times in the past as well that uh, 
banks need to understand that they don't want to become a dumb pipe over the period of time. So what they need to really do is offer the services to the consumers as well as to FinTech and build that ecosystem where they can uh, flourish. I wouldn't say just survive, but flourish. Yeah. So the banking as a service model, at the same time, I see quite a significant growth in the aggregator model as well with the new products and services coming out uh, especially in the UK market, like the VRP, the variable recurring payments. And so, yes, there's a quite a lot of growth in these spaces. You know, it, it's interesting because when we look at this, every bank is trying to, to take on an open banking platform, trying to determine if they should do banking as a service. And we saw in the research we just conducted as far as the way organizations said they're going to be structured, that a lot of organizations are trying to go to the embedded banking uh, platform, are trying to change the way they deliver services. But do you really see, I mean, especially in the US where there's so many financial institutions, and you mentioned that it's a way to help financial institutions flourish, but it's just really a way to help all financial services firms flourish. In other words, does the open banking platform actually cause a consolidation of the marketplace where there'll be less survivors mainly because there's only so many people that can play in this in the open banking field. So yes, uh, that's what we are going to see sooner rather than later in the market, right? With the potential downturn as well. I wouldn't say just in the open banking, but overall in the fintech sector as well. You know, the biggest challenge for the fintech sector, so whether it's a fintech or the financial institution, they have got their own challenges, right? The set of challenges. The financial institution, the struggle with the agility and the go to market, churning out the product quickly, and the culture. But at the same time, they have got significant amount of customer base, as well as significant amount of wealth or the capital. Fintechs are nimble, but at the same time, they don't have capital that's what they need. And the cost of capital is significantly higher. Similarly, the customer acquisition cost is significantly higher as well. So the challenge that they are going to face during the downturn, it is you will not be able to get more customers, right? The beauty is going to lie in how you're going to retain your customer and serve them better. So it's going to be a tough competition doing a potential downturn between the fintech and the financial institution. They got to work together. And we will see quite a lot of cash which fin fintechs and the financial institutions would be out looking for the cheap deals. So we will see a consolidation in the market overall. But as you rightly said about the open banking as well, yes, there was a limited market. And that's why we have seen quite a lot of interest from the payments companies as well as the financial institutions in the open banking players. Uh, you know, whether we talk about the fallout deal of plate or Visa earlier or the Finicity from the MasterCard or the other deals as well, because it's very simple. Whether you want to invest that much time in building something or if you are deep pockets, go and buy it, right? So build to buy the solution. So uh, yes, there's a significant potential for the open banking, as well as we will see a consolidation of the open banking platforms uh, sooner rather than later. You know, on the other hand, you know, with the and you referenced it in the economic situation we're in right now, a lot of fintech providers have to look at new funding mechanisms, have to look at new ways to grow because certainly the the marketplace for v, VC capital is not not as strong as it was a year ago. Even you know, so I think. You know, on the other side, we, do you believe that we're going to see a whole lot more partnerships between traditional financial institutions and fintechs and even maybe the acquisition of fintech to grow this open banking platform and to, to spur innovation in open banking? Uh, definitely, Jim, that is the way forward. And that's what I was referring to earlier, that in the potential downturn, we will see quite a lot of partnership. And that's what we have been uh, seeing and talking about that banks and the fintechs need to work together because they have the, got their own set of challenges as well as the uh, positives as well. So if they work together, that would be a best combination, right? So uh, the open banking platform or the fintechs can uh, spin up the innovation at a faster pace. Mm -hmm. But let's be realistic on the other hand as well. The last financial institutions, right? They are giving up for the competition, right? Whether it's from the culture, building up the innovation centers or the digitization. Right. So I always say this, that 
fintech has worked as a catalyst for the large financial institution to flex their muscles like cryptocurrency worked as a catalyst for the cbdc's right so uh, yes the fintech we can see that as a competition but they they would be better off with the partnership and building products and services together or building as well as rolling out and they can get benefit of the customer base of the large financial institutions as well as the capital access to capital is the challenge yeah yeah and, and it's going to draw a bigger the marketplace is going to get more robust because i think you know some fintechs are going to fall to the wayside they're just not going to survive but i think as organizations open up their eyes to what they need to do from an innovation standpoint open banking, embedded banking, banking as a service, all these things really lead us to a, a, a situation where the organization are going to really have to come together and bring, as you said, the fintechs don't have the scale, but they have the speed. They have the agility, while traditional banks have the capital, but probably not the speed and agility. So, you know, that that's going to bring in a very interesting um uh, change the marketplace overall, one that's being spurred by the fact that the marketplace has gotten tighter financially. So let's take a short break here and recognize the sponsors of this podcast. This show is sponsored by FIS. You may already have payments embedded in your software platform, but do you have the flexibility around how those payment experiences are created? What about the control of your pricing or the ability to use your own branding? Chances are, you probably don't. Discover WorldPay for platforms, a payments platform that puts you in control and puts your software customers first. This all-in-one payment facilitation platform offers more than just embedded payments. With WordPay for platforms, take advantage of a full set of solutions, including professional, managed, and advisory services to enhance your business. Make your software even better with a solution that easily integrates and adapts to your needs, helping you create the experiences beyond payments. Discover the possibilities you can unleash with WorldPay for platforms. Visit FISglobal.com backslash WorldPay platforms to get started today. Welcome back. I'm joined today by Ritesh Chen, FedTech founder and advisor and previous CTO of HSBC. Ritesh and I have been discussing the potential of growth for open banking in 2023 and whether the potential will actually be realized in the next 12 months. So Ritesh, again, with the transparency that open banking provides, banks are encouraged to offer digital services, fair pricing, and increased security. Open finance is probably the next step in this evolution of open banking. How do you see the evolution of open banking beyond just financial services in the future? See, open banking is a stepping stone, right? Yeah. Uh, and it's a stepping stone for yeah. the open finance in the future. What I see, it's a evolution of the financial services along with the payments. As we are seeing, the phenomena of payments are evolving from uh, the currencies from fiat to the digital and the digital assets over the period of time. Similarly, what we see like the open banking getting into the groups of apart from just the uh, payments or the aggregation, that's what we see today. It is going into the overall financial well-being of a customer that is from the insurance. You will be able to see the real time insurance sooner rather than later. You will be able to see the various sort of payments mechanism. Uh, we are seeing that growth in the different markets today and the different use cases. It depends on the national payment infrastructures as well. Sorry, I'm not directly pointing to India, but what I'm saying, like, there are the, the payment capability depends on the payment infrastructure in a jurisdiction, right? So what we are going to see, apart from the financial services, we are going to see the pay, open banking is going to play a role across the customer life cycle. Yeah. Right. And anything and everything where the payments are going to get involved and whether that will be your utility, whether that will be your mortgages, house purchase, renovations, automobile, you, you name the sector. And that's where we are going to see. So open finance, what we talk about, it's completely around the open data. So the consolidation and aggregation of the customer data from the various sources and enable third-party providers to provide better financial services to the consumers 
and that is the open finance and we are already seeing that into the multiple sectors and that is not only for the consumers so it is even for the commercial sector as well and yeah. the corporates and it is a much bigger value for the smes so what we have seen lot more use cases of the open banking in the sme lending see the smes are the backbone of an economy right so if you want to see the growth in an economy you need to push the smes and provide them that support and the ecosystem the financial support and with the view of the alternate data that's what we are seeing already and it is just going to grow from here onwards well it's interesting because we've seen some examples in uh, emirates nbd with the youth uh, open banking model also at uh, lakasha um we've seen it there as well where they built um complete relationships around the youth market which is not driving the revenues from a banking side but what's happened is the partners that want to reach those consumers those younger consumers with gaming with technology with communication with as you said payments opportunities you know this is building a whole new revenue model because it's not coming from interchange or from fees or the spread it's really coming from the outside marketplace wanting those integrations you know i also think when you're looking at open finance one of the potentials that's been talked about but not talked about as enough at least in my mind is healthcare the integration of healthcare and finance where you can actually innovate and and use you know the different monitors we have around our health activities to build a financial model around improved health benefits and what health wellness as opposed to just financial wellness so i think there's a lot of opportunities um you know when we talk about open banking when we talk about innovation we're really talking about speed and scale we're trying to make it easier faster and to have it scalable in digital banking transformation how do you think open banking will increase the speed of innovation see the open banking is uh helping out building that ecosystem for financial institutions to open up their apis for the various services right so the open banking platforms are working as an aggregator and they are providing these services to the third party providers to build the services around it right so definitely so it is directly helping up with the speed innovation and the scale so where the over the period of time what we are going to see we are seeing that today as well but it is just going to go in terms of the extent it really doesn't matter that who is the service provider at the end of the funnel the matter is from where you are accessing the service and that's what the future of the open finance that we are going to see whether the real time insurance the real time payments the real time access to the services the yeah. technology the music you you name it and it will be there so what we have seen the concept of the super apps in the past i see this more from the open banking perspective by utilizing the data from the various sources and providing the value to the customer for their overall financial well-being so uh-huh. wherever they have an interest whether it's related to the music whether it's related to the health whether it's related to the automobile whether it's related to anything ultimately it ends up in one thing that is the transaction so the open finance will be able to consolidate all those transactional value to the consumers and provide the value so we are going to see a significant scale of that and just to give you an example about uk for that matter uh, in 2020 we were looking at the open banking users around a million or so and by uh, last month we have seen the open banking users are around 6 million so it has grown exponentially and if we talk about the i wouldn't say just the open banking but i would say the infrastructure so there are umpteen example of the infrastructure growth in the payment space or the open network space where you are building that ecosystem we have seen that the best example if i can give you is the npci the national payment corporation of india the upi the unified payment interface which led and fuel the growth in the economy by democratizing the payments or for an example fat now so ritesh where do you see as you look to 2023 where do you see the most emphasis being around open banking 
And where do you see the biggest the biggest advancements being made? What do you, your prediction for 2023? What do you see in the world of open banking? See, in the open banking, of what I see in 2023 is the growth in the use cases, especially in the lending space, whether it's in the retail lending, the credit card space, the consolidation of the credit card. I wish I could tell you more, and I will be able to tell you more in, in a quarter or so, that what I'm doing in open banking space, mm-hmm. in the credit card space as well. Right. So, uh, at the new product innovation. Right. So we are going to see a lot more use cases Especially given the focus of 2023 and the potential downturn, we are going to see a lot more use cases evolving around the lending space. The second thing is providing the value to the consumers, whether it's from the whether consumers going to the music festival or whether they are utilizing the utilities or whether they are u- using any services, providing value around that. So you will see a lot more providers, the fintechs, coming up in that space where they would like to serve the customer and making their life easier as well as the cost effective. On the other hand, in the broader term, what I'm seeing, there would be a lot money. It is not just the open banking, but from the payment rails perspective as well, we will see a lot more payment rails coming for the cryptos. And we will see Web3 and Metaverse are a lot more used words in 2022. We will see that is growing as well. But specifically in the open banking, I have got a lot more expectation in the commercial banking and the SME space yeah. rather than just the retail customer. There have been quite a lot of focus on the retail customers and there's a slightly less work done in the commercial space. That's where we are going to see the focus. We have already seen in the retail space uh, where we are talking about the early salary You know, you can drop your salary at any point of time. You can uh, uh, change your service provider at any point of time with the better values and uh, credit space. You can get a better credit than your credit providers. You can consolidate all that. We have seen these sort of use cases which are already in progress or already exist in the one or the other economies. We are seeing going to see growth in those as well. You know, it's going to be interesting as we get to 2023 because, you know, we have these economic headwinds and tailwinds. It depends on what way you look at it. As you said, it really provides a bigger opportunity for open banking, both because of the partnership with fintechs as well as the, the striving for better efficiencies and effectiveness. Also, in this, you said, in the corporate and small business area. But as we look at open banking, the potential gets bigger and bigger. Do you see a, a movement from open banking and open finance to the emergence of super apps, at least by the big financial institutions globally? Yes, that's absolutely right. I definitely see that. Uh, It was years back and I was consulting one of the large bank and uh, it was basically at that point of time we were building a super app. Now that is the way forward. When you think from the open banking, as I said, that is the stepping stone. What do you really want to achieve? You want to get the 360 degree views on a customer profile on the customer, you want to be conscious as well as you want to provide the contextual services to the customer as well. So what is the best way forward is bundling and unbundling of the services. And that's what we are seeing in the banking space. So I definitely see that the large financial institution has got opportunity here to utilize the open banking as well as the open data platforms and the data that they hold, I wouldn't call it open data platforms mm-hmm. because that's a lot bigger to chew at the moment. So utilize the consumer's data, which they're already yearning to get a 360 degree view and provide the better services. Because customer will be going through a difficult time in 2023. And it is not just about 2023, in the future as well, if the financial institution provider can provide the better value, they don't have to look outside. So. Finally, um, as you look forward and we look at this big data and the, the, all the information about the consumer, there's still a question as to who will be at the center of the open banking or open finance solution. Will it be a financial institution or will it be a big tech company or somebody else? Where do you think the ownership, if there is such a thing as an ownership, of the open banking relationship will end up? Is it going to be the big tech or is it going to be the fintech or a, a bank? Do you know where it's going? We have seen quite a lot of movement from the big techs recently yeah. as well in this space, especially around payments. 
a long back, uh, it was quite a few years back, I said, Starbucks is a fintech. And yeah. people are like, why Starbucks is a fintech? I'm like, they hold a significant amount of cash of the customers. Oh, yeah. And we are seeing the reality. We have seen from mm -hmm. Apple in terms of on tap uh, yeah. card tapping facility, right? Uh, applications working as a pause. Now, what we are going to see, there's a quite a, so who should be more worrying, right? Whether it's the fintech or whether it's the financial institution with the big techs. Right. So I would say it's going to be a very interesting market, right? For the large financial institutions with the growth in the big techs as well, because the big techs probably, I use this word as a very cautionary as well, that they wouldn't want to get into the mainstream finance. At least that's what they claim. They don't want the, they don't want the regulation, obviously. Yes. yes. So, so uh, big techs are claiming that they don't want to get into the mainstream financial services. Right. But let's be realistic, as Bill Gates said long back, we need banking, we don't need banks. Right. And in yep. the future, that's the reality that we are going to see. The banks have to change the format that they work. Do you really need, uh, if we talk about a sizable bank, do you really need a quarter of a million people or between quarter of a half a million people to run a bank? That's right. a question. So right. the financial institutions need to focus on a couple of things, the culture, operational efficiency, because what is bringing them down is the cost. A large financial institution, if we talk about the top 10, they spend anywhere from say five to 12 billion a year in the technology. That is a significant amount of money. That's insane money. Right. right. So fintechs are, that's what I said, the fintechs are working as a catalyst for the large financial institution to flex their muscles to understand it. And what I see as in uh, competition, the big techs are going to be a, a wake up call for the banks. Yeah, it's, it's really going to be, it's going to be interesting because, you know, it, a, a big tech firm could easily be at the center and have finance being part of that whole open open finance model. Or, or yes. the, the big bank, and it, it will have to be a big bank, can include payments and, and all the technology solutions around the banking solution. It will be interesting to see how it plays out because it's really going to get down to who can innovate faster um, and who you want to put your bets on. You know, as you said, the Apples of the world, the PayPal's of the world, they're already have finance well ingrained in their organizations. And they also have the innovation and, and funding capability to move forward. It's just a matter of saying, how many other elements that can they bring? You know, there's, we, we look at how payments is, uh, you mentioned it many times in this podcast, that payments really is one of the major driving influences. And when you look at that, you look at, you know, what Amazon and other firms like that have done. And, and you look at also how WeBank in China has really embedded payments within their open banking model. It, it's it's going to be very interesting to see what, what transpires. And I think, you know, you, your major takeaway here, I think that as I hear is that we're really going to see a lot of movement in the open banking marketplace in 2023, driven mostly by our economic situation, that that it's it's looking making banks look at alternative solutions to get the consumer more embedded in their in their daily transactions and for engagement. So Ritesh, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. I really appreciate your time and look forward to hopefully meet up with each other in 2023. Thank you, Jim, and pleasure to be here. Thanks for listening to Banking Transform, the winner of three international awards for podcast excellence. If you enjoyed today's show, be sure to give our show a five-star rating on your favorite podcast app. Also, be sure to catch my recent articles on the financial brand and the research we're doing for the Digital Banking Report. This has been a production of Evergreen Podcast. A special thank you to our senior producer, Leah Hathledge, audio engineer, Sean Roe Hoffman, and video producer, Will Pritz. I'm your host, Jim Roos. Until next time, remember, open banking requires an open mind and a willingness to change banking as we've known it in the past.